let's get started with our presentation. There it is, okay. So um, last week you were looking um, at uh, the morning star of the Reformation and uh, how the Lord worked through John Wycliffe and uh, persuaded him from his word of, of certain things that you, you'll see as themes again and again in the lives of these reformers that the people should have the Word of God in their own language, that it shouldn't be kept away from them in some form that they can't understand. They need to understand this truth if the Lord is going to work in their hearts through it. Um, and that uh, as, as they look at the Word of God and, and compare how it's being uh, worked out in the church, they see certain things uh, that uh, are wrong and they stand up and they challenge that. Always, I think, uh, from the perspective that if everybody else sees it's wrong, everybody's going to want to change it too. And, and I suspect uh, several of these men were shocked and surprised at the reception that, uh, that they received when they began to point out some of the, the differences between what the Word of God says and the practice that had started to take place in the church. So now we come on to this man, uh, John Hus, or as I think um, we'll see, it's the, from the Czech Republic. That's where uh, that's where Bohemia now is, and uh, you would say his name was Jan Hus, or something a bit like that. Uh, my Czech is a bit rusty, um, but that's as good as it's going to get. Um, let's see a few things about him. I just want to give some background to his life, a little bit of geography, so we know where all this is taking place then sketch out some of the things that are going on um, around Hus during the time that he lives, um, politically and, and, and so on and so forth, and religiously. And then I want to just spend a few moments looking at some of the things, at least, that he began to teach and uh, that certainly put him at odds with the church of his day. And having painted that backdrop, then we'll be in a good place to, uh, to make the most of the movie. And uh, then we will get into the quiz. <clears throat> For those uh, keen quiz takers, I should say that not all of the questions are necessarily going to come from the movie and that some of them will come from this presentation. So um, listen up and pay attention Otherwise, um, I'm going to have to take all of this home, and uh, Pam and I are going to have to eat it ourselves, and that would be probably not the best outcome for anybody. But uh, let's, let's get into John Huss. Here's the headline news, um, and I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. Uh, first of all, born in 1369, um, I'm not sure how certain they are that he was born in this town called Hussinek. It seems a little bit coincidental that his name should be Huss and he should be born in a town called Hussinek. But anyway, uh, if you look up the authoritative sources like Wikipedia, they will tell you that is um, where he was born. Um, and it was uh, and it is a town in the Czech Republic, which was then called Bohemia. Uh, he went to Prague, uh, which was uh, the big city of that day, still is, and uh, was really quite poor and undertook, I think, a few jobs uh, to earn the money he needed in order to be able to get to the university and study. Got his Bachelor of Arts in 1393 and his Bachelor of Divinity in 94. Got a Master's degree in 1396. And uh, in the year 1400, he was uh, ordained as a priest. Um, he was, I think, uh, noted for how diligent he was in his studies and um, distinguished himself very clearly uh, as, as quite a, an able student and scholar. 
as a result of which he was appointed uh, rector of the University of Prague in 1402 and became preacher in a newly constructed chapel, the Bethlehem Chapel, um, also in that city. And uh, it was clearly a, a very um, good career step, if you like. It was very favorably regarded to have such a position as that. Uh, I believe you saw, I wasn't here last week, unfortunately, but I believe you saw that the teaching of Wycliffe was taken throughout the world and that one of the places that it ended up was in the city of Prague. And certainly um, John Huss was exposed to it and became quite sympathetic to it to the point where he saw the need for uh, some reforms to take place in the church. Um, <clears throat> however, he was not able to get very far down that path in terms of calling out for reform before the opposition came his way, so that in 1410, he and his followers were actually excommunicated from the church, um, and it reached the point where Prague was placed under an interdict. Um, that is a, uh, an instrument by which the church was able to prevent local, uh, local churches from um, administering the sacraments. And in the church of that day, if you were not able to take the sacraments, your salvation was basically... Um, very uncertain thing. And so it was a very powerful weapon that the, that the church of that day had in order to bring uh, disobedient people into line. They basically cut off the means of salvation according to their uh, understanding. And that obviously troubled people who thought that their salvation was dependent on, on receiving these things uh, from the church. Uh, <clears throat> Huss accordingly decided that the best thing for him to do was to go into exile um, in order to protect uh, the people of Prague. But from his exile, he continued to teach and to preach. Um, and it reached the point where the head of the Holy Roman Empire decided to try and bring about a resolution to the situation and it convened a council in a German town called Constance. Uh, you'll see it also spelled with a K and a Z at the end, Constanz. Uh, and this guy was called Sigismund. You'll see him in the movie. Um, I believe, although he was head of the Holy Roman Empire, he didn't qualify, um, uh, didn't have enough uh, points on his uh, emperor card in order to be called emperor. Um, so he was just called... Uh, he was some kind of a king, but not an emperor. And in order for Huss to be present, and Huss, I think, wanted to be there, he wanted to be able to explain uh, what he was teaching and to show that there was no um, uh, problem with what he was teaching compared with what the scriptures said, that in fact his ministry was faithful to the scriptures, um, I believe he was convinced that as long as they could see that, everything would be fine. Um, but he was given a safe conduct um, as somebody excommunicated from the church and uh, quite infamous in parts of the church by that time. His safety was in some jeopardy, so he was given a safe conduct uh, to go all the way to uh, Constance and to attend that council. And uh, this, uh, this was quite interesting when I prepared this. Uh, he set out on his journey to Constance exactly 600 years ago from yesterday, um, which is intriguing. And uh, you can see that it took him a little while from uh, the 11th of October to the 3rd of November to make that journey. I'll put a map up in a moment, and uh, I'll show you how long Google thinks it would take you to do it if you were to walk um, that distance today. And when he got to the town, he was initially free. He was able to preach. He was able to, I think he was under a kind of house arrest in a way, but uh, he was given quite a degree of liberty. Uh, but ultimately, he was arrested and he was thrown in, it says a dungeon. He was in a string of dungeons. And I think um, 
if he started off in the Hilton of dungeons, you know, he ended up in, in Red Roof and then somewhere um, below that even. Uh, so his health suffered, he wasn't fed very well, um, and he was in, uh, for several months, in quite a miserable uh, condition. Uh, the non-emperor, Sigismund, um, was very distressed because he had given his word. He'd given safe conduct to Hus to be there to defend himself and to leave afterwards. And now his promise was being broken. And um, the church leaders of the day basically managed to persuade him, as we'll see in the movie, that um, that was fine because after all, Hus was a heretic and any promise he made to a heretic um, you shouldn't feel that you're bound to keep. So then in 1415, after uh, some time in the dungeons, uh, Huss was brought out for what was called a, a council hearing, a trial, uh, on two occasions, on the 5th of June and on the 8th of June. And then he was condemned and burned uh, to death on the 6th of July. So that's a very brief overview of his life, and you'll see just a very small piece of that in the movie, so I wanted to try and uh, expand it a bit here. Now for some geography. Um, this is a very important country in the world, right here. Uh, this, this is quite important. I need to say that because of Pam. <coughs> but... Um, here is, uh, we'll get in a bit closer on this in a moment, but here is the Czech Republic as it is today, and the city of Prague is right there. And uh, we'll zoom in a bit closer on that. So there's the Czech Republic. Uh, that little red marker there is Husinek, or that's the, I know it doesn't say Husinek there. You need to zoom in a bit more to see that. It's a pretty small town. Um, and then, there is the city of Prague. Uh, that's a distance, I think, of approximately uh, 50 miles. <coughs> and uh, the only other place that we need to be concerned about, I think, is the place he was born, the place he ministered, and then the place where he went to defend himself in the council at uh, Constance. And um, here's Prague, and here's Konstanz in Germany um, on this lake. And Google says that if, if Huss had gone via the B300 road, um, it would have taken him about 109 hours uh, to walk it. Um, so all the way down there. It's a distance of 330 miles. I don't think the B300 was probably built um, back in the days of Huss. And in addition, I think there's a, there's a ferry that probably wasn't running um, in the day that Huss made that journey, and so uh, he had to skirt around that lake, I imagine. But it gives you an idea of, uh, of the geography and, and the distances involved and, and why it was that it took him from the 11th of October to the 3rd of November uh, to get down there. Quite a serious undertaking back in those days. <clears throat> okay, what's going on, not directly in Huss's life, but what's the, the environment in which he is uh, living his life and, and going through these situations? <clears throat> First of all, this was the time of the, the papal schism. Um, there were two popes at this time, believe it or not. There was one in Rome, and a rival pope in Avignon, in, uh, in France. And uh, somebody, some bright spark, decided that the best way to resolve a situation where you already have two people who think they're pope is to appoint another one. Um, and so there in 1409, Alexander V was appointed as a third pope to end the schism. And guess what? Uh, the other two popes decided that they didn't see why they should give up their papacy just because 
these cardinals at uh, Pisa, I think, at a meeting in Pisa, had appointed a third pope. So then you had three, and, and well, that just gets messy, really. Um, there was growing concern in the church over the effects of Wycliffe's teaching and how it was spreading, um, particularly in places like Prague, which was, with its university, was a, a, a renowned center of learning of the day. <clears throat> there were disputes over indulgences. This is going to start to... Uh, I think we may have seen something about indulgences uh, last week. It's a continuing theme, and here it is again, the idea that you can pay money um, in order to reduce some of the consequences that you might otherwise face for your sin. Um, whether those consequences are time in purgatory, um, which I think is the official teaching, um, but, but I, I believe in the enthusiasm to get the money in. Sometimes indulgences were presented that this was complete and utter absolution that you could buy, uh, provided you had sufficient cash in hand. Um, that was not um, a popular teaching with the reformers. And also in, in 1411, the successor to Alexander V, who, 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 only, who was appointed 1409, he died 1410. 1411, the, the man appointed as his successor, John XXIII, launched a crusade um, against uh, the protector of one of the two other popes um, who was based in Naples in Italy. So now you have open warfare between the various rival popes. So that's some of the, the backdrop. You can see it's quite a moving scene. A uh, lot going on, a lot of political machinations that, uh, that Huss would have been aware of and would be seeking to deal with in his ministry. So let's look at his teaching emphasis uh, now in a little bit of detail, and it'll help uh, us to understand why it was that really there was no way he was ever going to persuade the authorities of the day that they'd got it wrong and, uh, and that they should accept his teaching as being uh, true from the Bible, even though much of his teaching was biblical. First of all, he spoke against the indulgences that um, we've just talked about. He said, remission of sins comes through repentance alone and not by taking out a checkbook or an American Express card or whatever else we would have in this day and age. Second, he spoke against the crusade that John the, twen twen John the 23rd had launched. He said the Pope shouldn't be in the business of taking up arms in the name of the church because that's not what the church... Our warfare isn't a warfare that's fought with swords and spears and shields and so on and so forth. Our warfare is a spiritual warfare. Instead, the Pope should pray for his enemies and bless those who curse him. And you may be able to figure out where Huss was getting that idea from. And Huss openly admired some of the teachings of Wycliffe and uh, used them in his own works. There was one particular work that he wrote called De Ecclesia of the Church, which was written from that time when he had to leave Prague because of, of the, uh, the interdict under which uh, the city was placed um, around the year 1412. And here's some of, the, some of his understanding of the church and, and what he wrote in this book, much of which was actually um, lifted, sounds like a little bit uh, suspicious, but it was, it was heavily influenced by some of the works of uh, John Wycliffe. First, that Catholic means universal. Um, it's the church of all the predestinate, of God, all those whom God has predestined to eternal life. 
the universal church. That is what we should understand the word Catholic to mean. It was meaning something very different uh, in those days. Second, the unity of the church is unity of predestination, of blessedness, of faith, of charity, and of grace. Thirdly, and this is starting to get him into a little bit of trouble, I suspect, that the Pope, or any or all of the popes of that time, uh, and the cardinals do not constitute the church. Next, that Peter was never the head of the Catholic Church, but a confessor of Christ the rock. You are Petros, little stone, little pebble. And on this huge rock, the confession of Christ as Lord, uh, I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Next, um, that when the Pope came into being, it was because of an appointment by the Emperor Constantine. And up until that time, there had been no um, superiority attached to the position of Bishop of Rome. The Bishop of Rome was never considered greater or more, or more exalted than the bishops of any of the other uh, areas around. But it was only at the time of Constantine that the Bishop of Rome was elevated and made Pope. And that's obviously questioning his position and his authority. Next, uh, Huss rejected those diktats, those uh, statements, those declarations, the bulls that the Pope issued, which actually banned preaching. Uh, and there were some of those in his day. Um, they started not to appreciate the kind of things he was preaching, and so they, they, they issued an edict against them. Uh, he rejected the right of the Pope to issue indulgences. He said that Christ alone could forgive sins and uh, not this matter of paying for them through uh, indulgences. And he denied the infallibility of the Pope. Uh, you can imagine these were not the kind of statements that would win friends and, well, they influenced people for sure, um, but not in order to feel kindly towards us. Something else about Huss, which is uh, an interesting little factoid. Um, his name in the Czech language, Hus, or if you want to pronounce it that way, actually uh, means goose. And uh, because of the way that he was executed um, and, uh, and the, the circumstances surrounding it, the expression his goose is cooked, that we have today, goes right the way back um, 600 years to when the goose of Bohemia, John Huss, uh, was burned for his faith. And here's a quote uh, just to close this section from John Huss, and it's a question that I think is one that we all need to grapple with, and uh, we'll come back to it a little bit later on. He said this, What shall we lose if for his sake we forfeit wealth, friends, the world's honors, and our poor life? It is better to die well than to live badly. We dare not sin to avoid the punishment of death, to end in grace the present life is to be banished from misery. Truth is the last conqueror. He wins who is slain. For no adversity hurts him if no iniquity has dominion over him. And I think 
the gravitas of this man and the, the seriousness and uh, the thoughtfulness comes through in those words and also the challenge for us because we are inclined, especially in this day and age, to hold on at all costs to our wealth, to our friends. We were hearing in the sermon this morning about the honors of this world. Those are the things that we want to hold on to. And we want to hold on to our lives. And what does Jesus say about us if we want to hold on to our life? Um, that we'll lose it. It's those who give up their lives to the Lord who hold on to it uh, for eternal life. So I hope that's kind of painted a backdrop of the time, the place, the circumstances, and, and some of the, the details of the life of this man. Let's, um, let's get into the movie now, if we can, and maybe um, when it's started up, if I could ask... Uh, yeah, thanks, PJ. If you could take the lights. Thank you.